everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Welcome to RPV City Talk on the Road. I'm with the great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Dave Bradley, and we are coming to you to bring the mayor's monthly update from our city's beloved Hatano Farm. This farm has been making headlines, and our yes. mayor is going to tell you all about this operation, which is the last Japanese American farm on the peninsula. There's a story to tell, and the mayor is going to kick it off. We'll tell us about this farm and also everything going on in our city. So with that, take it away. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, yeah, we're sitting here today at Hatano Farm. Uh, as Liz said, the last operational Japanese American farm here in the South Bay. Years ago, Japanese American farmers were prolific throughout the city and the South Bay. One at Torrance Airport, uh, several here on the hill. Unfortunately, due to economics and various other things, this is the last operating one. Mr. Hatano passed away several years ago. Uh, the farm is currently operated by Mr. Martinez, who was was his longtime foreman. Unfortunately, the terms of the grant of where we the city ended up getting the land f that we currently are sitting on did not allow for commercial farming. So we were a little bit outside of the bounds of the land grant. So the city this year voted to bring ourselves back into compliance. So we are working with Mr. Martinez to work to get this site brought in as a national historic site. So we're working with the county, state, and federal government to see what we can do to be able to continue to operate this site as an ode to the Japanese American farmers into perpetuity. How that actually will work out is still under uh, discussion. Uh, city staff is working hard on that, uh, but we hope to have something come back before council so we can take action. Right now, the current lease will expire at the end of August of this year. We hope to have something in place well before that. And then uh, just another note uh, for historic sites, uh, Wayfarers Chapel is going through the formal process for a National Historic Site designation. They work uh, went through the first major hurdle before the National Parks Commission uh, back in Washington, D.C., and they passed that hurdle. Um, I think they have a couple more administrative things to do, but that's looking very positive as well. So uh, these two sites could be with new designations within the next uh, couple years. We make history in RPV, and especially with you as mayor. Way to go, Mayor Bradley. I mean, as a scene setter, this is about a five-acre site and we're looking ahead where you just were at the mayor's breakfast at Terranea Resort so we've got this spectacular panoramic ocean view in front of us and then of course behind us this incredible farming operation and like you had mentioned with the city's efforts to make it a historical designation and to keep it operating in that capacity, possibly partnering with the Land Conservancy as well, correct? Absolutely. The Conservancy who operates most of the open space for the city and provides um, conservation for those open spaces. We're in talks with them on how we could uh, operate this facility um, for the mutual benefit for both uh, the children of the peninsula, as well as the city, as well as the Conservancy, and make sure that we take all equities into account. Well, this really is a special place anyone can come hike here it's open to the public we've got a trail we're just walk we're sitting here through the trail system we've got Absolutely. Some beautiful sunflowers you know you pretty much what goes on here is flowers that they're growing and also cacti right now it is primarily flowers with some edible cacti in the past it has had vegetables it has had other things over the years but right now primarily flowers and uh, cacti all right, as we sit here on this farm, it is, feels like a beautiful summer day already. Summer is approaching, and with that, the city gets busier, and there's more concerns about public safety as well. We are in a high fire hazard zone, and that's the number one concern is fire danger and illegal fireworks. So with that, I know the city council has increased the fines for fireworks in our community. So why don't you tell what's going on? Yeah, Liz, um, as we enter summer and we start thinking of 4th of July, a lot of folks connect 4th of July with fireworks. Unfortunately, fireworks uh, in a severe drought in a severe fire hazard area just don't mix. So recently the city council increased the fines for fireworks um, within the city. The first offense is $1,000, the second offense is $5,000, and the third offense is $7,500. And this is not meant to stifle people's fun. This is meant to allow people to have fun in a safe way. I encourage everyone to have a barbecue and go out to a public fireworks display, mm -hmm. but don't bring fireworks home. It just doesn't mix. And this is consistent with the policies of the other three cities on the hill 
and most cities within Southern California. Um, it's just too big of a risk for individual backyard fireworks. Um, so please don't do it. Uh, the fines are hefty, but they're not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be dissuading of people doing the wrong thing. And along with the fire danger, there's other concerns. I mean, besides scaring your pets and for anyone that has PTSD, um, it gets very traumatic and it could trigger all kinds of response and as well as causing obviously injuries to, to people right. with fireworks. So obey the law and do not light fireworks. I um, mean, of course, if anyone observes anyone doing this, they should be contacting Lameda they Sheriff Station. They should be Station. calling the Lameda Sheriff Station and they will respond and issue a citation if they are able to catch anybody using illegal fireworks. And as we talk about Lameda Sheriff Station, I'm going to move on to uh, the next topic, which is the um, city's ongoing efforts to um, prevent crime using ALPR technology and the city council approved I'm installing two solar-powered ALPR trailers. That's yes. new. So we approved the purchase of two mobile ALPR trailers to be able to put around the city to help uh, reduce speeds as well as to continue to catch license plates of wanted vehicles. This in conjunction with the local homeowner association flock camera installations has really been paying dividends for the Lamita Sheriff Station to be able to see if wanted cars are coming into the city, uh, be able to target them and make sure that we have a safe community. This ALPR technology, uh, automatic license plate readers, they have done instrumental work as a tool in helping the Sheriff's Department law enforcement solve crime. So stay tuned to see those tra solar power trailers, which yep. will be a bonus since they won't run out of battery power. Right. The batteries the issues uh, between were the, the, were the prior ones. Correct? Right. Between the solar power and the battery backup, they'll last for days without any uh, monitoring or maintenance. Mm -hmm. Now, as mayor of the city, you sit on the regional contract law committee that meets quarterly uh, to discuss the contract with the station, sheriff yep. station and and talk about what's going on with crime and the latest statistics you just met we recently. Did. And what, what were the takeaways? So unfortunately, there is a slight uptick in residential burglaries and crime. One of the things that we've seen is because we live in such a wonderful community, sometimes people are not quite as vigilant as maybe they should be. People have a tendency to leave their vehicles unlocked. They leave valuables in plain sight. And these become more of a crime of uh, convenience as, as as opposed to really nefarious uh, activity. Also, the Lameda Sheriff Station, you know, is big on the whole idea of see something, say mm -hmm. something. So I would encourage all of our residents as we work with the Lameda Sheriff Station to increase patrols, to just make reasonable accommodations, lock your cars at night, don't leave value in plain sight. Uh, take some reasonable precautions to make it more difficult for somebody to do something nefarious as opposed to be as trusting as some of us want to be. Mm -hmm. And you can always contact Lamita Sheriff Station when you see something at 310-539-1661. Can't give that number out enough along with 911 of course but um, that's a, a great, a great, and um, but thank you for that. So, and you meet quarterly for your your updates. Yes, we do, and we meet with the um, other three Elected cities. Leaders. Um, for the uh, emergency safety committee and then the regional law, uh, we meet with the, uh, the folks that have contracted with the LA County Sheriff's Department. On topic of safety, uh, we're, since we're sitting out here enjoying Mother Nature, it brings me to what's going on with the wildlife around us. Um, more and more concerns about coyotes and rattlesnakes as well. Summer's here. So um, what's your message to the community about dealing with, um, you know, cohabitating with these creatures? <laughs> Well, the good news is we live in a semi-rural environment. Uh, the bad news is we live in a semi-rural environment. So uh, with that, we are going to get wildlife. So uh, we need to figure out how to coexist with our coyotes. The coyotes need to have a healthy fear of folks. So we need to be vigilant in not leaving pet food out, in providing, uh, leaving trash cans mm -hmm. uh, lids off, and make sure that the coyotes continue to have a legitimate fear of the residents. There are several uh, suggestions on the city website. Yep. And if you do see coyotes that are getting aggressive, please call the number on the city website. We'll uh, have LA County Animal Control out and uh, we will uh, endeavor to trap that coyote and take him off premises and remove it from the community. But yeah, if you see a coyote acting aggressive, please call the city and we will uh, do whatever we can to take care All of right. it. Our city staff is certainly being proactive. They hosted uh, at the end of April a wildlife watch forum which was recorded for valuable information yes. and they've published a newsletter and there's like you know like you said there's many things that we can be doing to deter their 
them coming into our neighborhoods right. in the mix. But we are having more and more sightings. It, yes, it, it certainly is concerning. Um, and with that, we're going to continue talking about animals in the community. That would be the peafowl. Yes. You either like them or you don't. Are you a fan? <laughs> when, I think when they, they fan out. I think they are a beautiful bird. You know, the, when the Vanderlips imported them into right. ranch, or into Palos Verdes back in the 20s, you know, they have become almost ubiquitous within the Palos Verdes. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, you know, there are some residents that love them and some residents that hate them. The city has had a peafowl management program for several years now where we try to manage the population. Since peafowl are not native to Palos Verdes, they have no predators other than the coyotes, but they nest and sleep in trees. So the coyotes don't really manage that population as well as you might expect. So we try to manage that population to make sure that uh, they don't overwhelm any specific neighborhood. We recently had a report from city staff on what the current census is, mm -hmm. and we're at a, about 134 birds throughout the multiple communities that host them, which is about steady state. So we did decide at the council level to suspend peafowl trapping for another right. year. Next year, we'll do another census and we'll see where the population are. Uh, and then we'll evaluate if we need to reinvigorate the trapping program. So the peafowl but, trapping program has been paused for one year. Paused for one year. Uh, and the idea is just to maintain status quo for the population, not to let it get out of hand mm -hmm. and also not to let it die off, but right. it, to continue in the multiple neighborhoods that have PFAL. Now we're going to move on to talk about traffic. Traffic. As we're sitting here along PV Drive South, and it's been pretty quiet for us, Dave. We got, came out here at the right time. But um, there's been some concerns along Hawthorne Boulevard. Yes. Uh, brought before council, specifically around the intersection of Valen Drive. Council voted, but you were a no vote, which we'll let you explain that why, um, to implement some calming measures along Hawthorne. So why don't you first explain the council's overall vote, and then you can talk about why you decided not to, to vote with the council on that one. Absolutely. So as you come down Crest Road from the Ralph's Market, the sweeping turn after you pass Ryan Park, there is a signal at Valen Drive. Unfortunately, as you come around that curve, many people don't slow down. And when that signal is red, they will do almost an emergency stop. Uh, some cars even actually go through that signal. So the residents have brought it up to city council and asked for help. We evaluated that at the council level, took some advice from our traffic safety committee, and voted to implement um, five, six different calming measures to try to reduce speeds as you come around that curve. I was a no vote on the overall package because I didn't want to install the rumble strips right. just yet. That was going to be, there was like short-term measures, you know, mid-range right. me measures, and you were thinking that would maybe down the road. So right, we, sorry. no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to put increase the signage, increase uh, mm -hmm. pavement markings, and see if we could get the the speeds down prior to installing the rumble strips. The rumble strips are going to be very noisy. Um, they will give a notice to the driver, but also it will uh, alert the entire neighborhood. And with about 1,700 uh, car passages there uh, a day, uh, all hours of the night, I'm just afraid that the neighbors off of Hawthorne Boulevard are going to be inundated with rumble strip sound. And I wanted to see if some of the less intrusive methods would calm traffic there prior to going to the rumble strip. My colleagues thought that we needed to go to the rumble strip sooner than later. So we did vote and uh, that is what's being implemented. And we will see how that goes over the next six months in a pilot project. And uh, based on that, we will go forward. Time will tell. I mean, I, I what I thought was as a, as a resident um, of RPV2, I, it was great to watch a, the collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. You saw, you know, residents get involved. They provided documentation of what's going on at that intersection. You, you had, so it was a sort of a team effort to come up with the solutions once again in the city. So like you said, we'll see what happens. It seemed like some of the residents that were there regarding rubble strips that were representing the HOA were still okay with it. They were willing to say, what happens with the noise? Yeah, unfortunately, the... Because it's uh, going to be the park that's going to hear that, that right. noise when the, you're at the, the park. The residents that are right off of Hawthorne, either to, uh, on either side, are going to be the ones that are most affected. But you're going to be analyzing it, and they're going to take a look and see how effective these measures are Absolutely. and come back, and as yeah. you always do. Now, all of these measures Tweak are it. not temporary, but they are movable. So the signage, the rumble strip, we can correct and see what works and see what doesn't work. 
Right. And that talking about a project like that brings me on to thinking about public works projects yep. in the city. Um, we have an incredible public works team in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and they're still recruiting for a deputy public works director. We absolutely are. And, 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 uh, and others in the public works department. Right. Uh, we have several uh, openings for engineers, as well as project managers, as well as a deputy for public works. And during the pandemic, it was one of those departments that it was hard to fill our professional positions there. We are actively recruiting for several positions there. And those get a lot of public attention because those are the projects that the public gets to see. So we are really looking forward to bringing on some more professional staff to support our our director you know because it was national public works week what what do you think makes our department stand out in our city and um, some of the big projects i mean who wouldn't want to work on ladera linda or the the landslide come one come all well i think if you're working in public works all you have to do is just look around us yes i mean you get to do public works in a literally a paradise i mean we are in a semi-rural environment in the middle of 12 million of our closest friends mm -hmm. but you don't feel like you're in the middle of los angeles so what an awesome opportunity to come and do public works projects here we have ladera linda we have portuguese bend we have the new civic center all of these projects are going to be within the public works department what a incredible opportunity to really make an impact on the city. If anybody is interested, I highly encourage you to apply, interview for a position. We would love to have your professional help. Right. And top of the list right now, of course, we have to let our residents know what's going on with Ladera Linda. That's the biggest public works project right now that's taking place. So give us a play-by-play -play of what you know what's happening. The buildings have come down. So Ladera Linda, we did the groundbreaking about two and a half months ago. Right, back um, in March. We did the first shovel turn and then the city council all got 20 pound golden sledgehammers and took a shot at taking down the main building at Ladera Linda. That was a lot of fun. The buildings have now been demolished and we are doing site prep right now. Uh, it's about an 18 month project from start to finish. So we are projecting that it'll be done uh, sometime early next summer uh, before the celebration for the 50th anniversary of the city. I think it's gonna be just an amazing project there. Um, it's gonna be a testament to the east side of the hill mm -hmm. and the new community park there is going to have a facility there for all the east side residents to use and enjoy. It's very exciting. So good job and thanks for the update. We'll be bringing many more of those as, as it progresses and it's on track. Will it be under budget? No. Well, you know, <laughs> we got it started before we saw this spike in inflation. So we are really hoping that by getting it started when we did, mm -hmm. we've mitigated uh, most of the large cost increases. So with interest rates rising and cost of things going up, uh, the fact that we started that project as early as we did with the type of financing we did, I think is really putting us on a sound financial footing. Well, maybe with that, we'll move on to talk about our proposed city budget since we're talking Talking about finances, can jump around here. We were going to talk a little bit about the uh, city goals um, that are proposed and the budget. So I don't know what you want to update regarding that. It's getting closer and closer to passing the 2022-23 right. fiscal budget and the goals for the city for the next year. So fortunately, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes has done a really great job with our financial planning. We're in a much better position than many of our sister cities from around the uh, South Bay and Southern California. We were very conservative in our budget planning and we have reserves that we're going into the next budget cycle with. Our businesses are starting to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful facility here at Terranea is um, come back very strong. Uh, some of our other uh, businesses are coming back strong as well, uh, which is allowing us us to look at our next year's budget and be a little bit more um, aggressive in what some of the things that we get planned to do. So additional food, uh, fuel modification within our uh, open spaces, mm -hmm. um, looking at additional tree trimming uh, from around the community uh, in the city right of way, um, something that most of our residents are very aware of. And then um, restoring and uh, trying to fill some of our frozen positions on staff. Mm -hmm. um, so over the last two and a half years, we've put a freeze on some of the positions, uh, see where we were financially. Um, also during COVID, it was really tough to hire new people and integrate them into the staff. So now that we have come out of the pandemic um, or coming out of the pandemic, uh, we're looking to bring on additional uh, help within city staff to really be able to serve the community and serve our residents. The city is in good shape. Absolutely. Finances are looking good. The goal setting process, you've improved. 
for the next year's goals under your yeah, direction. So We're going to have are, a new I'm software really program, new actually. Goals. Yeah, and in terms of to make it more user-friendly for the community to come on and say, let's see what our council is setting as goals. Are they being accomplished? Right. And to figure all that out. So we were tracking our goals in an Excel spreadsheet, and we had about 190 goals or 190 line items. It was very administratively time-consuming to status all these goals. Mm -hmm. So this year, one of my initiatives was how can we get these goals into a more useful, visual um, easily statusable um, format. So uh, working with city staff and using some tools that I use at work uh, on my day job mm -hmm. um, in project management, we came up with a more project management, more Gantt-focused um, way of looking at our goals. Hopefully a Gantt chart is what you're saying, the Gantt, Gantt chart, chart for correct. this. Which will hopefully allow the city and as well as our residents to really understand where we are on the goals and making progress uh, to being able to move the city forward in, into our 50th year. An issue that's concerned of the council and the community, it's being much talked about, is what is going on with affordable housing. It's an yes. ongoing dilemma for every community. Everywhere. Absolutely. We're all every town is dealing with how to... Um, incorporate affordable housing. On May 17th, the City Council did approve uh, the formate, supporting the formation of what's going to be the South Bay Regional Housing Trust Correct. that will work on this issue. I don't know if you want to uh, let the community know about the decision to support the formation of this trust and what this all means. So we supported the formation of the trust. It didn't mean that we we're going to join the trust. We're going to see how it works out. Mm -hmm. But we said we did have interest. And this is a regional trust that would help with financing within the South Bay of uh, affordable housing. We all know that affordable housing within Southern California and California in, in general is a really hot topic. And we are working with the state, with the uh, HCD uh, from Sacramento, on how to meet our affordable housing goals. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, we had representatives of HCD come down from Sacramento to tour the city, look at our unique topology, uh, to be able to understand where we were in our um, housing element. We did find out that we are actually leaning forward much more than many cities. And the number of comments we had to our housing element were about half of what comments were for other cities, similar size. So we were pretty excited by that and felt much better after our discussion uh, with the leadership from HCD. We're going to continue to work with the state to be as compliant as we can, uh, but also try to maintain the local feel um, and continue with our quest for local control. And when you're mentioning the housing element for the community that's watching, um, the city has a number of homes that after, er, there's a cycle that takes place, right, that how many homes, new homes in all price ranges that the city needs to build. Correct. And we've so, been instructed, the city's been... Well, not, not that we need to build, but, at least but have we need to for. zone for right. and plan for. So, so our number so is 648 over the next eight years, which is a huge number. Mm -hmm. And there are um, a lot of issues with ever being compliant with that number. So we're continuing to work with the state to try to figure out how we can be compliant um, and not completely change the tenor of the city mm -hmm. or bankrupt the city. Right. Um, unfortunately, in a very high fire district, semi-rural area, our egress routes are limited. Our infrastructure is limited. Um, ultra high density housing will be very difficult to accommodate within our city. What also is very limited right now, I'm going to move on, is water. We are in stage two of water restrictions. Correct. Um, as we sit here at this farming operation, right, I think about, you know, watering our yards and Absolutely. what the rules are now. Um, we also had Cal Water did a presentation during the May 3rd City Council meeting yep. um, talking about restrictions, the bills that people are getting and water tips. So what do you want to share right now? Your message is, Mayor, about what's happening with the water situation. So we are now down to two days a week for watering. Okay. Um, and it could get worse than that as we enter into summer. Um, we are in a major water crisis. Um, if you've been out to any of the eastern dams and reservoirs, they are at record low. In fact, um, Hoover Dam out in uh, uh, east of Las Vegas, I believe, is lower than it has ever been since it was built in the 1930s. So we really need to figure out how to conserve. Cal Water came in and gave us a presentation on various things that they have um, and tools that they have for the citizens 
uh, of the Palos Verdes mm -hmm. to be able to save water. I've taken advantage of several of those. Um, I encourage folks to go on to Cal Water's webpage, um, look at the turf re uh, replacement programs, right. look at uh, putting on low flow shower devices, all of those things uh, that Cal Water is there to help with because they're committed to reducing our usage as well. Yeah, they have a lot of re rebate programs Absolutely. that you can take advantage of and uh, you can go on the city website, Cal Water's website to find out the do's and don'ts and um, on how to conserve water. Absolutely. Less showers. Well, let's not <laughs> say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we want rain showers, but that's Absolutely. not happening either at the moment. Um, all right, we're going to move on to my favorite part of the mayor's show, and that's to talk about all the great things the mayor's got to do in the last month. And uh, So how about giving us an update on some of the mayoral activities that you enjoy during the month of May that you want to share with the public? So a couple things, you know, we've been working with uh, Marymount, California, which has unfortunately indicated that they will be closing here in August, trying to work with them to come up with the uh, go forward plan on where uh, that site will go. Right now it's zoned institutional and we really hope for another institutional operator to come in there to be able to operate that site and continue to work with the community. Another great thing that's coming up and this is a very personal one for me is uh, in a week and a half on uh, June 9th, my youngest son will be graduating from Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. Um, and in the completely circular uh, nature of things, uh, he'll be graduating on the exact same football field I graduated on 40 years before. This is my 40th uh, anniversary of graduating from Rolling Hills High School. Uh, my son will be graduating from Peninsula High School. Different name, same football field. So uh, I'll be out there next Thursday uh, wishing my youngest son uh, all the best as he moves on into his next chapter of life. Uh, but really exciting, 40 years later, to be on the same football field to see my youngest son graduate from my alma mater. That's very exciting. Congratulations to your son and to your family. It's such a wonderful rite of passage. And now you're going to be an empty nester? Yes. So we will have a, uh, a sophomore at the University of Oregon and a freshman at the University of Arizona. That's fabulous. And um, on this subject, I want to also just congratulate in advance all the graduates. This is an exciting time um, for all the students that are graduating. And I also had the opportunity um, to go to Marymount California University's final graduation. Uh, yes, it was bittersweet. Bitter, it was bittersweet. Um, but you know what? I think that was a day still to celebrate for all those graduates, including our own city clerk. Yes. Um, her daughter graduated, so I had a chance to talk with her. And, and the students were so optimistic. And what they said is, you know, the, the university is not just about the buildings. You know, it's about what will they'll retain, what's in their heart. So they'll take it with them wherever they go. And, right. and so, I mean, and uh, so they had a beautiful day, and it was a wonderful ceremony. So and I, my kids went to preschool there, so um, it, it was emotional to yes. see the future. And it would be nice to see if maybe another school comes in. Right. I know there's all kinds of buzz in the community about what will actually become of that property so yeah. we'll have and, to see and we're working with the administration to come up with as much of a win-win as we possibly can yes any other mayor's announcements as we wrap up i know as i'm looking at terranea resort right across the way in this beautiful ocean view just before here you were at the mayor's breakfast that you host every month with our local uh, chairs and leaders of our committees. Yeah, it was uh, it was another great breakfast. Uh, we were able to hear from the committees and commissions, uh, things that are going on within the community, um, share some things that are going on from council point of view. Uh, Councilman Alegria was there to join me. It was a good meeting once again. Uh, Captain James Powers from the Lomita Sheriff Station was there, mm -hmm. as usual, to talk about public safety. Um, things are going well in the city. Um, we're fine-tuning things as we go into the summer public safety being a big concern of a lot of people as well as uh, what we're doing going into the 4th of July. We're on the eve of Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be participating in Memorial Day celebrations um, at Green Hills on Monday um, and then we'll be having our 4th of July celebration at City Hall in a month and a half. Hopefully folks will be able to come out for 4th of July. Um, it's an exciting time but don't bring home any fireworks. Exactly. Obey the law, no fireworks. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up unless you have any other announcements. I don't have Just, anything else other um, than it's a great place to be on the eve of summer. Yes. Uh, and I can't wait for uh, uh, summer to be upon us. All right. Thank you, Mayor Dave Bradley, for what you and the council are doing on behalf of the city. It's a pleasure to just be out here on this gorgeous day, this beautiful farm. And I will be hearing lots more about the farm as we Absolutely. continue with trying to get this to be historic.
site as well. And be safe out there. Enjoy the summer. And we'll be back with the mayor next month. Until then, have a great day. Thanks for watching RPV City Talk. Thanks for joining in.